Uh, today's daf is daf Lamed Hay. Uh, two days before Kabbalah's Torah, Matan Torah. Anyway, um, 48th day in the Omer. We pick up on the bottom of or the middle of Lamed Dalai Lamed Bet, and we're continuing to work our way through the Mishnah. So we first had a question about whether you, when you throw the blood, a puzzle person throws the blood, does it make the remnant of the blood no longer shirayim, no longer able to be used for doing this Rika Saddam? And now we go on to the next part of the Mishnah where it says that if various invalid people do it, you can go ahead, it doesn't invalidate the Korban, not do it, like do the conveying of the blood or, or whatever, um, it doesn't invalidate the Korban, just do a redo, okay? So, Kibel HaKashav Anasam L'Pasal. A kosher person gave it to an invalid person, the invalid person gives it back to the kosher, do a redo, it didn't invalidate the corporate, it was more like it was nothing. And then it has a list of scenarios. So the is going to say, Tzricha, you need all the scenarios. The Ashminu and Pasal, if it had given us the example of an invalid person, have I mean, my Pasal Tame, that the invalid person means specifically a Tame person. And then I would have had a way to limit that and say, because it's a more lim, because the problem isn't as weighty in certain ways. Um, that's why it doesn't invalidate. Why is Tame not as weighty? The Chazi Lavodas Tzibor, because if the majority of the community is Tame and you have to bring a regular fixed time Korban, you can bring it even Betumah. So since there are times when Tumah is allowed, if you did something Betumah, it didn't invalidate, and it didn't, it didn't validate, but it didn't invalidate and go do it again. Um, of a small, but if you put it from your right hand to your left hand, right? Um, lo, maybe that would actively invalidate because you're you're never allowed to use your left hand for a even for a fixed korban. So the says, "Yes, Minut Small had just given us that example." Do you say hechsher biyom kippur? No, but there is one day and one korban that you're allowed to use your left hand on Yom Kippur when he brings the fire pan and the incense with both of his hands, one with one and one with the other. So because there is one case where its left hand is permitted, maybe also that's why it doesn't have the power to actively invalidate. I just think he had two right hands. Yeah, right. How about Klichol? Well, but if it had just given us the example of a non-sanctified vessel in, the, in use, which is never allowed, I might say that that actively, I, I, I would have said the same law wouldn't apply, and, that would, and, a, and, and a, a non-sanctified vessel would actively invalidate. Um, but it just given us that example. That's because it's not. It, there's it can be fixed. Just say some words, sanctify it, presto. So that's why it's not seen as an active invalidity. Avohanach, but being tamei um, or using your left hand, aim um, low. You can't fix. Well, tamei, you go to the mikvah, but it's not as easy to fix. Okay, and and uh, your left hand, you can't turn it into your right hand. So I might think that those things do actively invalidate tzricha. That's why you needed all those scenarios. No matter what the invalidity, if it's not something like the throwing of the blood, you know, if it's some other type of a thing. So if it's done invalidly, it doesn't. The Corbin isn't kosher, but it's not actively invalid, so just do it again, uh, if it could be done again. Okay, now the Gemara says like this. Why don't we go apply, this is obviously, this is a dichoy, it's like one of those regular things that you can't get away from in Kachim, the same way like people and dichoy are like two of these things that you never can get away from in Kachim. Anyway, so dichoy is something was fit to be used, it gets into a state where it's not fit, it's considered pushed away and rejected, and once you're rejected, it's like, don't try coming back. Like, you know, once a professor has passed over for, uh, you know, for tenure, it's like, you're not getting tenure. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, okay, anyway, so this blood, since it went to my left hand, let's use that example, it was in a state when it was, for that moment, in a state when it was not fit to be, you know, you, you know, and a voter wasn't fit to be done with. It so that should make it just rejected, and now we can't go ahead and do a redo. Okay, well, they have a decoy. Why not make a decoy? So, uh, so why isn't it a decoy? I'm a little bit of 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 a the bit of a little 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 of dichoy. He says that even if something is in a state where it can't be used, if it, the state changes or the circumstances change, it could be reused. Okay. How do you know that? Let's say the Chuyin. Uh, uh, not, uh, excuse me, uh, I don't know, let's say the Chuyin. So this is, so this is what happens if, you know, you have to have the pair, right, of the goat, on Yom Kippur, the goat that goes La Zazel, and about the uh, blood, the goat that you put, put the blood, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the uh, inner sanctum. So, um, so what happens if the boat, if, if, so there's three opinions as Rashi lays out about what happens if you lose one of those goats and then you need to do a pairing again. So one opinion is if you lose one of those goats, even if the other goat is alive, 
there's dehoy even by live things. So the live goat that you have left, since for a moment it can't be used because it doesn't have its pair, that can't be used either, and you need to bring two totally new goats. That's dehoy bebalei chayim. There's another opinion that says, no, if something is alive, you don't have dihoi, ain't dihoi b'vale chayim, but if the blood, if, if the, the goat was slaughtered, the uh, you know, for the inner chatas, and you caught the blood, and then you lost the goat azazel, then you have to throw out the blood and start it all over again, because the blood was dihoi, something that's inanimate can be rejected and pushed away. And then you have Hanana Mitzri, who says, even in inanimate objects, there's no dihoi. Even if you have the blood and the other one was lost, the blood is not rejected. Get another animal, pair it up with the blood, as it were, and then go ahead and continue using the blood. Okay, so Hanan Mitzvi does not hold the dihoi even by inanimate objects. Um, okay, afilu dam because even if the blood is in the vessel, <coughs> it's already caught in the vessel. Maybe chaveru mizavigla, you bring the parallel, you know, uh, a goat, and you and you pair it and you go on. Ravashi Amar kol shaviyadu lo have dihoi. Ravashi says, no, there's another reason it's not Dichoi. <laughs> Even if in general you hold of Dichoi, something that could be trivially fixed, now he doesn't say trivially, he says something that's in your power, but there's an element of trivially, something that could be trivially fixed is not considered like it ever got pushed off. But it was just like, oh, this is just a slight problem. I fell on the ground, I'll pick it up, you know? It's like it's not seen as getting into a state. Oh my God, it's in a state and it's unusable. Now we have to reverse the state. It's a, whatever, it's a, little, it's a technical, it's a little problem. I'm going to fix it right away. There's nothing, you know, so that never really gets the label of being pushed away. So here, if it's in my left hand, I just go ahead and put it back to my right hand. Now, the reason I say trivial, so therefore that's never considered dehoi, because it would be trivial to just put it back into my right hand. Okay, the reason I say trivial is because in the case of the goats, right, or why don't you say even if you lose the goat, the blood isn't uh, isn't dehoi, because just get another goat. What's the big deal? Just get another goat. That's piyado. You can go, you'll go bring another goat. So it, clearly it's not enough, but no, we do say that that case, the blood is considered rejected. So clearly biyado is not sufficient. It has to essentially be trivially biyado. Rashi more or less says that. Okay? But kosher biyado, anything that's like trivial and it's in your ability to fix, it, it doesn't get into a state of dehoi. Kosher biyado lavi dehoi. I'm going to have like Ravashi makes sense. Because who do we know holds of the principle of Dichoy? Reb Yehuda. We know that there's a Reb Yehuda position who holds of the principle of Dichoy. How do you know it? Okay, that if the blood gets spilled, you have to let the Siyol Azazel die, meaning you don't actively kill it, but anyway, you start the whole process again. So that's a Dichoy even by a Balchai. Even the living Siyol Azazel is pushed away if its pair got lost. Or Mesa Mishalech Yifpach Adam. Similarly, if the one that was on Lazazel died, the blood has to get thrown out, and you do another whole pair. So that's a more obvious case of Dihui by something that's not a Bachai. But anyway, Rabbi Huda, it's clear that he is of the position he holds of Dihui, even the even the most broadest definition of Dihui, even by Bachai. And nevertheless, the Shamina lay the Amar called to be a lot of The same Rabbi Huda holds of Dihui. I can prove to you that he says that when it's in your hand to fix it and it's trivial, it's not Dihui. Where do you see he says that? The time we turn to Brisa. That what they would do on Pesach is they would be shechting, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of sacrifices. The place would be a madhouse. Inevitably, or there could be a concern that some blood got spilled and some blood of some person's korban wasn't put on the altar. So what Rabbi Yudah says is, I got the perfect fix. At the end of the day, before the day is over, scoop up some of the blood on the floor of the Azara, again, assuming that all the bloods are equally commingled. In that, if there was any dr blood, any that got spilled and didn't get put on the altar, in that mixture will be some of that blood, and then you throw it on the altar, and boom, you fixed it, okay? And by the way, now you'll say, but that what do you mean? It's microscopic, that a blood of the kosher corn, of the of the corn that needs to be fixed. Or Rebbe Huda is of the position that ain dam mevato dam. Okay, that if it's all if it's all the same substance, it's all blood. It's ne everything is considered present. Okay, it doesn't. It, it, no particular blood loses its identity because there's no loss of identity because it's all blood. So therefore, Reb Yudah says, here's a way to make sure that the blood that got spilled, if there was blood that got spilled, is now being put on the altar. Okay, so what problem is that's all very nice, but what about dichoi? For the time that it was on the ground, it was not. It was not in a position to be put on the altar. So you see, if it's able to fix, it's considered to be not a problem. Okay, so not dihoi. So the Tzimur says, Shmamina. Well, yeah, exactly. That's move up the Yuchalit Kon. Good point. Shmamina, Kosha Biyad Olohabe, dihoi, Shmamina. You see that if it's in your hand, it's not dihoi. Good point. Okay, Gufa. Now, let's go back and look at that actual debate now about Korpen Pesach or that position. 
Tanya, we're talking about Rabbi Yudah, Omer Kosech, and I have Malim Yidam at Haroves, Sh'in Yishapeach, Yishfach, Echad, and if one of them gets spilled, uh, of the blood that never got put on the altar, Nim Soishu Machshira, through this will make it kosher. I'm a little Rabbi they said Rabbi Yudah, but Lolo Nit Kabo Bekeli, how do you know? Maybe the blood that got spilled on the ground that you're trying to fix, didn't get spilled from a klisharis. Maybe it went straight from the animal's neck onto the ground, and therefore this isn't going to fix it. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the answer is, okay, but so I won't fix that case, but I'll fix the case when it got in a clean it's spilled. Like, I'm not promising you I'm going to fix every case, but I'll fix the cases that can be fixed. So I never really understood this question, okay? But anyway, that's what they said. Ah, how do you know it's going to fix it? Maybe the problem is worse. So I so, oh, oh, so the you're saying, says, maybe you're just gathering blood that just went to the ground to begin with. I mean, it was everything you're gathering. Yeah, blood. not everything. What are you talking about? There's tons of blood. Let me ask what he's saying. The part no, you're no it's not just, just. Not just. You get an equal mixture. Anyway, so the Gemara says, so the Gemara says back, how do they know that it wasn't chronically? Maybe it wasn't. Now, again, okay, maybe it wasn't, but maybe it was. At least I'm fixing something. So maybe it seems that it's a problem, you know, that maybe the problem is not just that you're not fixing it, but maybe there's an active problem if you're throwing invalid blood on the altar. Okay, like we had the whole question, if you throw invalid blood on the altar, does it make the rest shirayim or something? We never said that there was some, like, isser to do that. But somehow that's the question they're asking. Him. Ah, maybe there's some real invalid blood there that you can't fix. So the Mar says, I'm a lehen. So the writer continues. He said back to them, top of Lamed Ha'im Ba'alef, no, I'm only talking about a case when it was caught in a vessel and then spilled. So the Gemara says, so how does he know that was the case? What do you mean I'm only talking about the case? Meaning, it's not like we wait to the end of the day and get every Kohen to report if anybody ever had a spill and then we're going to decide. What he's basically saying is we do this as standard operating procedure. At the end of the day, since there's a likelihood that some blood got spilled and this is going to be the fix. So again, I don't understand why he has to say, I'm only talking about that case. And then the Gemara says, well, how do you know that? I don't know that, but what I mean is that's the case it's going to fix. You do this a standard operating procedure, maybe there's some invalid blood it won't fix, but I'm doing it for the case of the invalid blood that can be fixed, the one that was caught in the vessel and then got spilled. So I really don't really understand what this whole discussion is, but anyway. What is worth of translating it the way I was trying to say is that uh, maybe the blood that you're coming back up in the, in, in, in the, in the clea that you're now trying to fix never was on the floor. Not, not that you're trying to fix blood that never was on the floor, meaning but if you're just gathering blood into a clea that never ever got to the floor, to begin with, then, it's not, then you can't throw it on the Mizbeach because it was what they... So then, he, then he's saying, no, 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 I only... I, I'm talking right, about- so that's what I said. The only way that, that there's a way to... It's not the question you're only gathering that blood. You're gathering all the blood that has a mixture of all the bloods, okay? But the... So the only way to understand what the issue is is if there's an assumption that there's some isser of putting invalid blood on the Mizbeach. But let's also remember that you're gathering a total taroves. So there might be traces of invalid blood. So we have to assume two things. We have to assume that there's somehow an, you know, an isser of throwing invalid blood, and that's isser is even when there's it's only traces of it or whatever. That's the only way to explain the debate, but I just don't know why we're taking that assumption. Anyway, we continue. So the Gemara says, How does he know this? That's an interesting word. High means fat quickly. Because Kohanim are, are, Kohanim are, are careful. From so the one hand, because they're careful, we assume that they, all the blood gets caught in a vessel. On the other hand, Avdin Hai, they, they, they act, they're very, very fast. Okay? And then it's built. So, so basically, be, the act of catching the blood, we can assume that, you know, you have to wait when cats stop to catch the blood. So that we can assume that they're not going to let an animal be slaughtered without the blood get caught. But then, they're like very fast. And if you're running and very fast, then an accident can happen and some of the blood and the blood could spill. Okay, and now the Gemara says, one minute, hello, Dama Tamsi, some Uravo. But one minute says the Gemara, you know, if you're picking from all of the blood that got mixed up, um, you have some blood that was not Dam Hanefesh. You have some of the blood that was just blood that came out after the life forces seem to have left the animal. And that's not blood that goes on the altar. So again, the presumption seems to be that even though you're all doing it for a legitimate purpose and there's a lot of kosher blood here, whatever, that if there's some puzzle blood, you don't want to be doing it. Okay, so the Gemara says, Velo Dama Tamsi Smurpa, Rebilo Tamik. No, Rebita says that even the non-life blood is considered blood, and presumably, therefore, can go on the altar. The time we talk about the Brisa. Dama Tamsis, you get a negative prohibition, but you don't get kares, because on one hand, it's blood. On the other hand, it's the, the when the guitar says kares, it says, you know, it says, kinefesh kol basar bedamohi, et cetera. It emphasizes the blood of the soul. So the point is, this is blood, but not soul blood. 
and therefore you don't get kares. The Behuda Omer the kare. The Behuda says you get kare. So presumably he thinks that either it is soul blood, or he thinks that he doesn't hold of the whole distinction, and he treats all blood the same. So therefore, according to him, this blood could also go on the altar. It's not a problem of putting invalid blood on the altar. So the Gemara says, one minute. It might be when it comes to the prohibition of eating it, he doesn't make draw that line. But when it comes to what blood atones, there he agrees that you need soul blood. The blood of the soul atones. Now the point here should not be whether it's curry dam, because Rabbi Huda's whole point is that it is called blood. Either way, it's called blood, but that's just a stock phrase of the Gemara. Rabbi Huda's point is even if it's called blood, and even if you get karate, clearly you need dam and to be machafa. So we're back to our question, which is, again, we're having some assumption that even though this fixes the issue, you shouldn't be throwing puzzle blood on the Mizbeach. So before we had the question, maybe some of the blood on the floor was blood that never got caught in a vessel, so you'd be throwing a little bit of puzzle blood on the Mizbeach. That's the only way to explain, explain the debate between Regan and the Chachamim. And here the problem is, some of the blood is not the soul blood. And now because you're taking blood and you're throwing it on the altar and it's a mixture, some of that is not is, is not kosher blood being put on the Mizbeach. So the Gemara says, um, so now it seems different, right? Now it seems that the Gemara is saying the problem wasn't that the invalid blood was going on the altar. The problem was was that the invalid blood was negating, erasing the presence of the valid blood that you needed to put on the altar, and it was causing bittel. And the answer is that there's no bittel because blood and blood there's no bittel. Of course, if that's true, it's not clear to me why the Gemara had to ask about Dam Hatamsis. Why did the Gemara just ask about, about you know, all the blood of all the kosher of, of, of that, of that was put on the altar, that there was still spillage, right? There's always going to be spillage, even of blood that eventually gets to the altar. So why didn't the Gemara just say, there's all these bloods here, and they cause bittel? And the answer is, there's no bittel. Okay, so, okay, there's no bittel. But what we still sort of, like I'm saying, is unclear, is how much is the Gemara bothered by the idea that within this mixture that everything is present, is it a problem that some of it is a puzzle? Or, you know, not a problem. That's the way to understand why how the exchange before that they said, oh, maybe some of it never got to a Kali. But anyway, here we don't seem to be bothered with it. Some of it is Dama Tamsi is fine. It doesn't cause Bittal. I got the good blood and I'm going to put the, so since it has some of the blood that needs to go on the altar, I go ahead and I do what I was planning on doing. All right. Anyway, so the Gemara says like this. I'm a review. I said, Rebbe, you divrechem, lama pokim ha'azara. According to you, that you don't feel that you should be gathering blood and throwing it to solve this, why do we know that what they did on Erev Pesach was they put a stopper, you know, I said that they had like this channel, like, you know, in the ground that like with running water, that like all of the stuff, you know, all the blood that's filled or whatever, they would squeegee it and it would all sort of go out. Okay, but on Erev Pesach, they put a stopper there. Right, so imagine like you're in Israel and you're trying to wash your floor in Arab Shabbos and you put the, well, you know, I love it. They just throw the bucket of water, right, and the soap mm -hmm. and they don't have to, whatever, but you do it, but then you never open up the drain. Okay, so you're walking around in soapy water. So that's what they did here. You were walking around in blood. So I says, I know why I I know why I think they did that on Erev Pesach, so that you'd have all the blood that would still be there and any blood that spilled or whatever, and you know, and then you'd be able to do my fix. But according to you, that you're not, you don't do my fix, because you're afraid that there's, I don't know, what, what, what either you're afraid that there's bittel or you're afraid that the uh, puzzle, bl there's blood there that can't be fixed and that shouldn't be put on the altar. So why do they stop, why do they put, what, you know, what, you know, why do they uh, stop up the uh, drain? So he says, So Amrullah, they said to him, it's beautiful. The Kohanim are walking around in a hole in a few inches of blood up to their ankles in blood, okay? During the uh, <laughs> Well, that's the next lesson of the Gemara. Maybe it's somehow that it demonstrates, I don't know how this is a Shavach, maybe somehow it demonstrates how much Korbanot are brought today. Certainly, I, the idea... Like, Can I, I should be sure that we've named Yisrael, right? Shouldn't that be that? Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I know. I, 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 I can't get it. It's like, you know, it's like most people, we think of animal sacrifices and like a lot of people nowadays, right? There's this like a uh, instinctive, like a, uh, you know, visceral recoil, oh, the slaughtering and this and that, and that's supposed to be a holy service. This is like, no, embracing it. 
like somehow, you know, embracing the bloodiness of it, somehow that's like what sanctified a vote. I can't get into that mindset. I don't understand it. Yes. Yeah, but anybody who eats meat, that's what happens in a slaughterhouse. Yes, but you'd rather, at least for our sensibilities, you want to sort of be protected from that. You want to get your chicken that's completely, yeah. doesn't have any smell, doesn't have any whatever. Nice and wrapped. Nice and wrapped, and nice, no blood, right? Anyway, so this is a very opposite sensitivity, sensibility. Okay, anyway, um, so, so, okay, that's their answer. But now the question says, one minute, Vadam Havichatitsa. Now, this is a question, even if you, uh, regardless of why you're stopping up the, the blood, the reality is if they were walking around in a few inches of blood, so what about the chatzitza problem? The blood is getting between their feet and the floor. So the Gemara says, no, a liquid isn't considered a chatzitza, okay, because it's not like a real barrier, you know, you push down on a liquid and, you know, you're, you, you know, you can get to the floor, okay? It's non hadam avad yovad vash, blood and ink and, and, and honey, the halav and milk, if they were dried up, so then they are a chatzitza, lachim, if they're still moist, ain chatzim, it's not a chatzitza. Now that's not said about kahuna, that's said about like going to the mikvah, but anyway. Again, all these questions are not about Rebbe and the Rabbana. Once you're saying that's the reality, we have some problems to solve. Okay, um, their their big day kahuna, which went like down to their like you know ankles, they're getting they're getting dirty. It's not how you If the garments were like you know soiled, um, the avad of sapsula, the avod is invalid. So how is this valid? Maybe what they did is if they lifted it up, you know, they sort of uh, what's it called. Uh, <coughs> Hiked up there, you know, the, the, the bottom of their, uh, 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 at the bottom. So, Batanya, Mado, Mido Bad, Kimidoso, Shalo Yachsev, Shalo Yosi. It has to be exactly his, 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 to his, you know, tailored to his height. Now, you could say that's a din in the begin, not the way it's worn, but more elsewhere says it also has to be worn that way. It has to be worn going down, you know, to his ankles. Mm -hmm. So, what are you going to do here? It's going to invalidate. So, Gemara says, Oh, no, no, no. This, they would only do this when they would bring the limbs to the altar, and therefore it wouldn't. That's not a real avodah, and mm -hmm. it wouldn't matter. Of course, they would mm -hmm. only walk in the blood. So the is, about what would they do the rest of the time? They would hover the rest of the yeah. like. What do you mean they would only walk in the blood? If that's what's going on, that there's a three inches of blood, they can't determine when they're walking and what. So the Gemara is going to get to that. Okay, the lava avodah. Oh, are you telling me you don't need to be wear big day kahuna when you're doing the walking of the limbs to the altar? Vatanya. Okay, that's bringing it to the ram, to the ramp, and presumably it needs to be a kohen and it needs to be with big day kahuna. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's not a thing that doesn't need. Fine, fine, fine. The only time they would walk around in the blood and that we'd say, oh, it's beautiful. They're walking around with their feet in the blood. Look how wonderful this looks. That's all, that's when they brought the brought the wood to the altar, That which doesn't really technically need a Kohen or a big tekuna. So the Gemara says, okay, that's wonderful. So what are they doing all the rest of the time? So the Gemara says, hey, how would they walk for the Avoda? So the Gemara says, there would be like these little platforms, not external, built into the ground, raised raised platforms on the ground. Would mean they were so, always there? So, yes, I don't know. What's it saying? It's saying on Erev Pesach, like, you know, when they're bringing all the korbanot, everybody is standing. I mean, you, you understand, like, you could build, a, not, not, not an external platform, you could build the ground with raised sections, you know, raised little things. So what it means, they're standing on these raised things and they're shechting and they're catching and then they're jumping from one to the next. You know, I mean, Ooh, you know. Could be just like, okay, Ooh, they're yeah, going to be the walking. Like goes in the Fine, ground. they're walking. Yeah. But it's pretty funny. Now we have a whole different scenario, right? You have a whole series of raised platforms and, and all of this to allow them for when they have to bring the, the wood to the altar, to allow for that one a voter for them to walk in blood because somehow we're supposed to think that that's a beautiful thing. Like this makes like no sense. I don't understand this. For Rebbe Yehuda, at least it's a way of fixing the Korban Pesach. Okay, but yes. Isn't the entire architecture the Azar supposed to be as specified? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't really understand. Okay, moving on. Mishnah. All right, that's the end of that discussion. Let's take a look at the Mishnah. Back to people. Now we're going to wait for people. So the previous discussion is what if a puzzle person has these types of thoughts and that led us to our discussion. Okay, now we say you slaughter the sacrifice to eat something that's not normally eaten. Or to burn something not normally burned. So it could be not normally eaten because it's not edible, like physically, it's like, I don't know, the hoof. Um, or it could be not normally eaten because it's normally burnt on the altar. Okay, and that's when um, So in those cases, 
kosher. It's kosher, okay? If if you are thinking that you're going to eat the entrails or burn the meat or something like that, uh, that's uh, Rabbi Eliezer posts that. Rabbi Eliezer invalidates. Presumably, he doesn't say it's pigo, but he does invalidate. So that's mechashvin according to Rabbi Eliezer. Okay. Uh, now, your plan is to eat something normally edible. You're going to eat the meat, but at the wrong time. Burn the, you know, the uh, entrails at the wrong time. But, you're only planning on doing it with less than a kazayat's worth. So some of this was implicit in the earlier Mishnayos. Anyway, the, the, the korban is still valid. That doesn't make people. That thing was a full zayas made up of not two types of eating, you know, but of, of an eating and a and a burning on the altar. I'm going to eat half a kazayas at the wrong time and burn a half a kazayas on the wrong time. So in that case, um, kasher, uh, kasher, the korban is still kosher. She'en achila v'aktar mitzarfin. We, this is things we've seen before, right? The, the eating and the pact about burning it up on the altar, those don't combine. If I plan to eat a half a kazais at the wrong time and a half a kazais in the wrong place, that combines to invalidate. But an eating and a burning on the altar does not combine to invalidate. She'en achila v'aktar mitzarfin. Hashokhin is a zeba. So now it's, we're talking about a case of something that's not normally fit to be eaten, but not fit to be eaten for a more simple reason, not because it's normally burnt on the altar, but because it's just inedible, okay? So you have your thought to eat any of these various things at the wrong time, but they're inedible, so you're not going to invalidate the sacrifice, okay? It's kosher. Now, so what are these things? So, uh, or is, of course, the leather, Rotov is weird. Rotov is like the gravy when you cook it, but like obviously that's no, that's not inedible, but that's not the korban itself. It's just the gravy. Okay. Um, umina kipa kipa is also like gook at the bottom of a pot. That's or rotov and kipa is something that sometimes comes up in other contexts. So you know you, the or the, the rotov and the kipa is not really directly relevant to this. Anyway, umina alal the alal is like the. Uh, the sinew, I think, or the bone of the, uh, like, yeah, the sinew in the neck, which is very tough and not edible. Uh, where are I? I lost my place. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The bones. Um, important discussion that gets around issues of gelatin or whatever gets to, to yeah. things like this about bone. Does it have marrow? Does it not have marrow? The uh, general, the sinews, horns, the hooves. Okay, so any of these things are inedible. Now, that's that it's not considered <coughs> enough of edible thing to make it into pigo. What about if your animal is pasul or preif? For example, this is why it's relevant to gelatin, and you eat these parts of a treif animal, or you eat these parts of an animal that's pasul for another reason. The animal was left over and it became no tar, right? It was left over day and now it's invalid for that reason. The ain mishum pico venosa retame. If the animal became no so was left over, or the animal became pico because the because the coin thought to eat to eat the meat in the wrong place. So the whole animal becomes pico when he plans to eat a kazais in the wrong I mean at the wrong time, right? Or a tummy person touches it and it's invalid, or your tame or whatever, and you can't eat the korban when you're tame, and you eat from the hooves and the horns or whatever. You did not violate. They're not meat. They're not edible. They're not part of the portal. Okay, and that's why some of this discussion, you know, is relevant to like uh, the gelatin issue. Okay. Now, Hashoch is a muktashin. If you shecht sanctified things, Rashi says um, that whenever it says the word muktashim, it actually means female animals. I don't know why that's true. I don't know what's anything implicit in the word, but in the context always when we say how, if you do muktashim, is then we're going to talk about something that's unique to it being female. Okay, so you slaughter these sanctified female animals. Lecho shalilo shilia b'chutz, and your plan is not to eat the meat in the wrong time or the wrong place, but to eat the uh, the fetus or the um, or the uh, placenta. Now, there's a question, a whole difficulty about trying to get to the bottom of exactly what the Gemara thinks the shalil and the shilia is. But anyway, for our purposes, we're just going to translate it as fetus and placenta. Okay, how do they translate it in English? Fetus and placenta. Fetus, fetus and placenta. Fetus but I'm just, and, after, and after, which is the placenta. But I'm just telling you, like the whole placenta, is it really what the placenta is? Because there's other places that it makes it sound like the placenta becomes the fetus or whatever. Anyway, but we're just going to translate it that way. Anyway, so that's your plan. Lo pigel. So it's interesting. You should have said but chutz is mano, but okay, because we're talking about pigol. But anyway, you don't make it pigol if your plan is to eat that. Now, why not? So presumably that's edible. The fetus is edible. It's not because it's inedible, but presumably it's a, because it's not considered to be 
physically part of the sacrifice. This is a question about Uba Yerachimo, you know, which to some degree, I mean, Uba Yerachimo is used by some post in the whole abortion discussion, right, which ties di directly into the, you know, contemporary discourse. It's my body, I get to decide what to do with my body. No, it's a separate living being and so on. How much do you see the fetus is just part of the mother as a limb of the mother or not? Um, so anyway, but where it's more used in the Gemara is not around questions of abortion. I mean, it's more used in the Gemara for sort of more technical Corbin types of issues and things such as this, okay, which is the animal becomes pigle. If you thought about eating a kazais of the meat in the wrong place, right? The, your thought was, oh, excuse me, there's two scenarios. One is your thought is about the fetus and the other is your thought is about the animal, okay? So let's read the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, if your plan is to eat the fetus, you do not make it pigle. If your plan is to eat the, presumably, although this is what the Gemara is going to challenge in the first line, or raise the first line, if my plan was to eat a kazais of the korban in the wrong place, I also, the fetus wouldn't be pigo. Presumably, the point is, is that the fetus is not considered to be one unit with the mother. So a thought about the fetus does not make the mother into pigo. A thought about the mother does not make the fetus into pigo, presumably. They're considered to be two entities, okay? That's at least presumably. We'll see what we get in the Gemara. Um, okay, so uh, now. Uh, now, it's pretty clear that that's what's going on in the mission about one entity, because here it talks about eggs, okay? So you shech, you know, the turtle does to eat their eggs. Now, what do you mean their eggs? The eggs that they left behind in the nest? Presumably, it means that the eggs that you might find, you know, inside of the mother. Anyway, so that also, the plan to eat the eggs does, the, inside the mother does not make the mother into a pigo because presumably it's a separate entity. The milk of sanctified animals, again, notice we're talking about milk and fetuses, so it's muktashim, so it's female animals, okay? And again, the eggs of uh, turtle doves or whatever. So if you actually made the mother people plan to eat a kazayas of the mother, you know, of the animal in the wrong place in the wrong time, so and then you, and so now you're chive on all edible parts of the animal, you're not chive if you eat the milk of the animal. So the, one case is your thoughts about the fetus and about the eggs don't make the mother. Now you, you know, people, now you have the thought about the mother and you're gonna now eat the milk or the eggs. So the mother is people, but the milk or the eggs are not people. Those are separate. Of course, what's missing from the end of this Mishnah is the case of the fetus. Mm -hmm. So we know a thought about the fetus doesn't make the mother people, but by, 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 by silence, one gets the idea that a thought about the mother could make the fetus people, and that's what we're going to explore immediately in the Gemara. Okay, and similarly, even if the thing became what's left over and no sir and tummy, whatever, these things are either not meat, they're certainly not meat, and, and or they're also not part of the mother. Okay, but you get it? But what we have here is, so we've got, oh, I should have left my lovely picture of my cow. Okay, we've got a mother here, and here's the fetus inside. Okay, there's a little baby fetus, whatever. <laughs> Looks like a person. Anyway, okay, well, I guess it will have a little baby cow. Okay, anyway, and that's so. Now, so the, it says, if you have a thought about this, here's your thought bubble, here's the Kohen, Okay, you have a thought about this, the mother doesn't become people. Okay, what it doesn't say is if you have a thought about the mother, does this become people? Logically, you would say, if this way it doesn't become people, the other way should it be people. It's a separate entity. But the end of it said the case that if you have a thought about the mother, the end case of the mission was that if you have a thought about the mother, it says what doesn't become people? It says the milk, right, doesn't become people. Okay, here's your bucket of milk. Okay, the milk doesn't become people. So, but, but, but it never said what the story would be about the fetus, all right? So the Mishnah says, if you have a thought about the fetus, the mother doesn't. If you have a thought about the mother, the milk doesn't become people. Okay, what about the, does the fetus become people? So that's exactly, is it possible to be some asymmetry here? And why would there be asymmetry? If it's not part of the mother, it's not part of the mother. So that's what we're gonna see as soon, now as we turn to the Gemara, yes. So the milk and the eggs are not pigal or no tar or tame, but are they muta? Are they chulin? Um, yeah. If they're not part of the sack of the korban, what are they? Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, like, right. Does it still get, I mean, 
Right, because like the milk is still something that's a, that, 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 that's produced by something that's sanctified. If I sanctify a tree, the fruit that goes afterward, right, although there it's caduceus betacabias, it's a caduceus misbea. Um, I mean, no, I assume that it's still owned by the Beis Hamikdash, mm-hmm. but it just doesn't have like caduceus korban. But if it's produced by a korban, chalav um, and by psuei yeah. If the if an animal this thing right. sac- yeah, has no, been sanctified, right. no, 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 I get it. it no, you're right. You're right. No, no. If it was taste of betica bias, there'd be no question that this would be straight. Well, that's the whole question about how we gidule hektish is a debate in the Gemara. Yeah. But that's gidule hektish by betica bias. This is essentially gidule hektish, you know, by um, by kashemis beach. Um, I'd have to check. Okay, let's take a look at the Gemara. Um, I'm a rebel lezer. Pigel bezevach needs pagel shalio. But shalio no need pagel bezevach. So he basically says explicitly what was implicit by silence in the Mishnah. Okay, if you have a pigel thought about the mother, actually the fetus does become forbidden. If you have a pigel thought about the fetus, the mother does not become forbidden. Now, what is the logic <coughs> about that? So, um, so me. the way Rashi explains this is Rashi says it has to do with how edible the fetus is considered to be. The fetus, like, you know, Rashi doesn't use this term, but basically we have a category like in halakha called like nechal idea dechak. Things are eaten in cases of, you know, of like a, 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 a difficult circumstances you would eat it, but not under normal circumstances. Okay, so what Rashi says is the following, is in order to make the animal pigo, your thought has to be about something that is normally eaten. So a thought about the fetus, it's not about being one unit with the mother. The thought about the fetus does not make the mother pigo because it's a thought about something that's not normally eaten. But once you've made the mother pigo, then anything that is somewhat edible becomes forbidden. Okay? So you need something a little more normal in order to, in order to make it forbidden. But once it's forbidden, all parts of the animal that are even somewhat edible are, are forbidden. That's why Rashi reads it. It's a how edible is it? The next two cases, though, there's an easy, are going to also be cases of asymmetry, and there's going to be an easier explanation about for the asymmetry. So let's take a look. Okay, now, pigo ba'alal nit pagla mora'a. So now you're dealing here with a, a bird, and by a bird, the neck muscle actually is considered um, is considered edible. So you have a plan of pigo for the neck muscle of a bird. So now. Even the mora'ai, even like the stomach where, you know, stuff gets digested and whatever, even that becomes people. okay? So that's like you had a pigo thought for the animal, even this thing about the stomach or whatever becomes people. But the mora'ai, if your thought was about the stomach, okay, lo pagla alal, the rest of the bird does not become people. Now, why not? So Raji gives his old answer. The stomach is like edible, ayudea the chak, right? So therefore, if the bird becomes pigol, then anything that's somewhat edible also becomes pigol. But because it's not normally eaten, it doesn't have enough to make the, for, you know, to that to be a, the source of the pigol of the bird, okay? So that's the way Rashi explains it. It's like, it can become pigol, but it can't make pigol. Tosos has a much cleaner explanation. The only problem is that it doesn't work well for the shalal, for the case of like the fetus, but it works for this case and the next case, which is, so it says, it's not about whether physically it's edible. It's about what does the halacha say you're supposed to do with it? Okay, pigle thoughts only work on parts of the animal that your the Torah says, the halacha says you're supposed to eat or burn, okay, or put on the altar. The, 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 the mora'ah, the sort of crop of the gizzard or whatever, the crop of the bird, the stomach of the bird, the Torah never tells you to eat it and never tells you to burn it. What you normally do with this crop of the bird is you basically toss it. So because it under, even when, even when the animal is done properly, is not part of the eating or the burning of the altar. It's part of the discarded parts of the altar. Therefore, a pigle thought about it is not relevant. Okay? So that's the way Tosa says. So pigle thought about a part of the animal that was never commanded to be eaten or burnt is not a pigle thought. But if you made the animal pigle, then it applies to any edible part, and this is considered at least a somewhat edible part. Okay, similarly, and the next case makes Tosas' as a scenario even clearer, okay? Pigo be a murin it pagla parim. Now, since it says parim, right, it, why does it say parim? Why doesn't it say korbanot? Because it's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a shorthand for saying, we're talking about the parim hanisrafim. Certain animals, right, like on Yom Kippur as an example, the blood was put in the inner sanctum, 
and what did and you burnt the entrails on the altar. What did you do with the meat of the animals of a chatas that the blood goes on the inner sanctum? Anybody know? You burnt it outside the base of mikdash. Okay, so the meat is not edible. Now Rashi would say not edible because it's supposed to be burnt. So that's sort of Rashi, like it is a not really edible category. But Tosa says not because it's edible or not edible, it's because this meat, according to the Torah law, is not supposed to be put on the altar and is not supposed to be eaten. So you can't have a pegal thought about, the pegal thought is that you're misdirecting it. Something that was supposed to be eaten and supposed to be burnt on the altar specifically, burnt on the altar, you're misdirecting. This is something that was neither supposed to be eaten nor supposed to be burnt on the altar. So a pegal thought about the meat is not a problem. It's not a misdirecting of it. Okay, clear? But if people thought about the about the Amurim, which is misdirecting, makes all edible parts people, and the meat is physically speaking edible. That's the way Tosos is. Where Tosos, the issue is, uh, doesn't work again for the fetus, but the basic, the simpler issue is a pegal thought has to misdirect something that is headed to the altar or to human consumption. And therefore, the, it does not apply to these things. So Pigo be imur means pagla parim. If your pegal thought was about the entrails and then the, the, then the meat is pigal, even though the Torah says burn it, if you ate it, you would be high for pigal. Okay? But pigal be parim, lo need pagla imurim. If your thought was about the meat that's supposed to be burnt outside, that doesn't create pigal, because that's not misdirecting something heading to the altars or to a human. Okay, lema misayeye. Now that's, so that's his interesting examples of asymmetry. So now the Gemara is going to see if that's true or not. Let's see if I can prove this. Is that true about all the chatat offerings or just this? No, just the one that the blood is in the inner sanctum. Okay. A, a normal chatat offering, the blood is eat, the meat is eaten by the Kohani. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, let me say Let me try to support this. The shavim shimchishe ba'achila parim u'pesrei fatan lo asav lo kuf. So there's a debate of Reb Shimon of the Chachamim about whether this pigul by parim hanisrafim, because Reb Shimon says anything, or the Chachamim say, excuse me. Uh, no, Rabbi Shimon says anything that the blood is not put on the outer altar, you don't have pigal. So Rabbi Shimon categorically rejects pigal by parim hanisrafim because the blood is put on the inner altar. But even though the Chachamim basically hold of pigal by parim hanisrafim, they agree that the following cases are not pigal. The Shavim they agree. If you had a plan regarding you're going to burn it in, the, in a different place or burn it at a different time, or what are you going to do with the meat of the sacrifice, you didn't accomplish anything. So this really makes Tosus's point, right? The same point is, you know why you didn't make the animal pigal? Because it's about something, it's about meat. It, it's not about stuff on the altar. And it's not about stuff you're supposed to be eating. It's about the meat that you're supposed to burn outside of the temple. So that's not relevant to the world of pigal. So you got it? So if your thought had to do that you're going to eat the meat that's supposed to be burnt outside of the temple, or you're going to burn it in the wrong time, in the wrong place, whatever, that is not people, because that's not about a part of the sacrifice that is intended to be burnt on the altar, or that's intended to be eaten by human consumption. Now, my love, fine, so that gets us that point. Now, what it then to address is, what happens when you have a pegal thought about the entrails, okay? Because if you have a pegal thought, presumably, the Chachamim say there is pigul, I mean, not presumably, they do say there's pigul by Parman Yisrafim. So where does the pigul by Parman Yisrafim take place? It's not about eating the meat, because that's not relevant. So the only pigul by, Parma, by the Parman Yisrafim could be if it's about the entrails. So presumably, says the Gemara, if you had a thought about the entrails, my love, now the meat becomes pigul. So that's exactly your proof of this asymmetry. So the Gemara says, lo, not necessarily, Maybe it is symmetrical. Maybe because a pigal thought doesn't work on the meat, the meat doesn't become pigal. So then where do you get pigal by parmani srafin? If you have a pigal thought on the entrails, then the entrails become pigal. Okay? And even though the entrails are stuff that's supposed to be burnt, if you ate them, you'd be chayv kare. Okay? Which is funny because normally pigal speaks about like there's two parts, a mat, and whatever. Anyway, but that's the point. We all agree to the principle that a thought about eating the meat that's supposed to be destroyed outside the base of Mikdash is not a pigal thought. Pigal thought has to be misdirecting something that's supposed to be on the altar or human consumption. So that's not a pigal thought. We all agree that that does not make the animal pigal. The question is because that meat is excluded from pigal thoughts, what's the story when the animal does become pigal? Does, is the meat also similarly excluded and there's a symmetry? Or do we say, no, once the animal became pigal, 
The meat also becomes pigle at pigle with the animal. Yes. So these entrails that burn on the altar, uh, although we normally would not eat them, they're treating them as if they could be eaten. Right. I mean, they're physically able to be eaten. Yeah. And if you did, you transgress pigle, although you violate other things. So they're supposed to oh, be yeah, yeah, yeah. Altar. Right. Correct. Okay. So now we're, now we're going to continue to try to prove it. Tashma, come in here. Parmani srafim v'siyamani srafim, molim behen mishahuktashu. So you have these parmani srafim that we're talking about, things that are going to be, the blood is going to be in the inner sanctum and the meat is going to be burnt outside the temple. So mi'ila begins from the time that you sanctified them. Now nishchitu, now you shechted them. Huchshru li pasel betfu yom v'chus kipur mubulina. Now because they're meat, you shechted them, now they can become Puzzle if a tummy person touches them, a tful yom, somebody who went to the mikvah that day, even, even only residual tumor, somebody who hasn't brought a sacrifice, so therefore is still not totally tahor. Anyway, now it's meat, so it could become tamay. Ubelina, the key that we're focusing on, on is, and now, of course, no big surprise, if you let the meat lay, let it stay overnight, then it becomes puzzle because it's no sar. That's what lean is, it's slept over the night. No big surprises there, but the Gemara now is going to make an interesting jump. If the meat can become puzzle when it actually, this is a meat though, when it's that it's supposed to be burnt outside the temple. So what does it mean that it's puzzle belina? It means that if you leave it overnight, it becomes nosar. And if I eat it, I'm high for nosar. So meat that actually stayed over too long, even though it's not meat that normally is eaten, it's meat that's burnt outside the temple, the laws of nosar apply. And now the Gemara is going to make a fascinating jump between the world of thought and the world of action. Like we're Kabbalists, right? Is the oh, I'm, 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 anyway, the world of Asiyah, the world of, anyway, the world of thought and the world of action, because so much of Pigal is because you're planning on doing it, it's like you already did it. Okay, so the is gonna say, if this meat of Parim Hani Srafi, the laws of Nosar can apply, then why presumably the laws of Pigal uh, of plans of the wrong time should apply as well. Okay, and this is to prove that if you have a Pigal thought about the entrails of Parmani Srafim, the meat becomes pigal the same way the meat of Parmani Srafim can be no sir. The meat can become pigal. Okay? So the Gemara says, my love, Lina's Buster. Presumably it means that the meat becomes no sir. Okay? Of Parmani Srafim, even meat that normally is burnt. And should I therefore infer from this, Migo de Paslabalina, Paslabamachshava. Since the meat can become no sir, the meat can become pigal because pigal is light. It was all done in the wrong time. Is so therefore the effect is pigal is turning the thought of wrong time into somewhat of the reality of wrong time. So if the meat can become no sir, the meat can become pigal. So that proves the asymmetry. The thought about the meat doesn't make the animal pigal. Again, a parm honey rough him, but a thought about the amorim would make the meat pigal. So the says, no, lean us anymore. No. Maybe it means that only we're not denying this jump between thought and action. But maybe when we say that the animal, Parmanis Rafim, can become nosar, what we mean is that the entrails can become nosar. Maybe the meat that is supposed to be burnt outside the temple never gets a status of nosar. No, Lina not think we're in. So, Hami, one minute, that's one minute. Hami, Tani, safe for one minute. But the end of that, um, you know, Bright the teaches, Kula, Marlin, Behen, Albeza, Deshen, Achi, Yuta, Chabasa. All of these things, Mi'ila continues to apply even as you, after you're burnt, when you're burning it, the meat until the meat like completely chars, okay, completely dissolves. Okay, so therefore the end, we're talking, we're talking about where are the problems lie, we're talking about the meat, because we're talking about the mi'ilo applies to the meat until the meat totally dissolves when it's being burnt. So michlal the ratio linas bosa. So since the end we're talking about the meat, earlier when we spoke about no sar by these animals, presumably we're also talking about the meat. Man says, no, mediaria, what type of uh, proof is that? Hakidisa mahakidisa, each one is in its context. Reisha Imurim, in the beginning when we're talking about that uh, the Parmani Srafim become no, so we're talking about the entrails. The Seifa Basar, and then we're talking about the meat. So again, that's a pretty big push. Well, it's, I mean, that's like Dachuk, you know, that's that's a pretty a, a difficult reading. But anyway, that's what the Gemara says. Certainly the shot of it is, is that the meat does become no sir. But to me, what's more surprising is the Gemara just takes for granted this jump from the world of thought to the world of action, that if the meat can become no sir, obviously the meat can become people. Okay, so again, by Parmani Shrafim, we know that a thought about the meat doesn't make the animal pigal because the meat is supposed to be burnt outside the temple. The question is, does can the meat become pigal? Do you have this asymmetry? Okay, and whoever it was, Rabbi Lezer said you did, and it seems to be proven here, and let's keep on going.
Okay, mostly Rav, Rav, Rav. The Elish ain't the following. The following things here's another brayta that do not become that cannot mifaglin do not make the animal pigul. They meet paglin. They themselves don't become pigul. Okay, what is it? So tsema shabroshe kvasim the hair at the on the head of the of the of the uh, sheep. So even though you burn the sheep with its skin, you don't burn the hair on the head. So therefore, a thought about burning the hair on the head at a wrong time is not a misdirecting because the hair is never supposed to be burnt. And it also doesn't become pigul because it's not edible. Okay? Mm -hmm. So these are not things that are normally burnt or eaten. Therefore, they don't make pigul. And because they're not edible, they don't become pigul. The se'ar shebzakan hatiyashim and the hair of the beard of the goats. Ba'or rota ba'kipa va'lal. This is like our Mishnah. The skin, and again, or and rota ba'kipa is not so relevant. Anyway, the, the sinew in the neck, that's not edible. Ba'mora'ah, the crop, ba'tzamot, the of a bird. Anyway, ba'tzamot, the bones. Ba'gidim, and the sinews, ba'karnayim, the horns, ba'tzlafim, and the hooves. Vashalav, vashaliyah, vashilya, there's those, okay, the fetus and the embryo, and the, let's say, the fetus and the, and the placenta, the chalav muktashim and the milk, ubeitzi tarim, and the eggs. So the milk and the eggs are, are edible, but they're not part of the animal, okay? And this, we don't know where, what this holds about the, about the uh, fetus. You know, the easiest read about this is it holds that the fetus is edible. It's like the milk and the eggs, okay? And therefore, it, but, but it's a separate entity. Because it's a separate entity, it doesn't make the mother pigol, and the mother doesn't make it pigol. Kulan lo mefaglin velo mitpaglin. All of these do not make the mother pigol and do not become pigol. The ein chayavin aleya mishum pigol no serve tamei. Okay, now pigol is a little redundant. If the mother became pigol or the animal became pigol, you're not high for eating the hooves or whatever, or not even high for eating the milk or the eggs or the fetus. Okay, that's because again, it's a separate entity. Okay, either it's inedible or a separate entity. Also. Though, if the animal was left overnight, or the animal, or your tame, you're also not high for eating these things. Okay, so that's interesting. You you shechted the mother. You left. So again, why you're not chaya for eating the next morning? You left it overnight. The hooves is because that's inedible. Why am I not chaya for eating the next morning? The fetus. And the answer is because the only thing that's considered to be the korban is the mother. The fetus is not considered to be the korban. It's seen as a separate entity. It's seen just like as the milk in the you know that you know that you know you know that that's in the udder, and therefore. Okay, even if the whole korban was left overnight and all the meat became tamay and the fetus is meat, I'm not chai for eating the fetus because the fetus is not part of the korban. Okay, so it's not mifagel. It doesn't make the mother pigol. It doesn't become pigol. It's a separate entity or it's inedible. And similarly, if the whole whole animal became no serotonin, whatever, it doesn't apply to this thing. All right, so anyway, so it says like this. Now, if you brought them outside of the temple, you are patur because these are not normally things that are offered up in the temple. That's why. Okay. Now, my love, okay. So it's clearly this, the, the, what, the, what it seems, seems to be saying is, I mean, this is totally pshat. They don't make the, mo the, the, the mother people, and they don't become people when the mother does. Okay, so this would actually prove the opposite of Rabbi Eliezer's statement. Because remember, Rabbi Eliezer's statement was also about the fetus. And Rabbi Eliezer had this asymmetry. The fetus doesn't make the mother pigul, but the mother makes the fetus pigul. This brayta seems to say explicitly not that way. It deals with the case of, of the fetus, but it fills in what wasn't said in the Mishnah. And it says that in the case of the fetus, it both doesn't make the mother pigul, and the mother doesn't make it pigul. So that's against Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer held of an asymmetry. So the Gemara says, lo, uh, lo, no, says the Gemara, no, that's not necessarily what it means. It means, lo mefaglin et hazevach, lo mitpaglin machmat atzman. No, it means they don't make the mother pigul. And again, if your thought was about the fetus, it both doesn't make the mother pigul, and it doesn't make itself pigul. But all it's excluding is when your thought is about this thing. It's not dealing with the case when your thought is about the main animal. If your thought is about the hooves, they, it doesn't make the animal pigle, and the hooves aren't pigle. If your thought is about the horns, the horns it doesn't make the, the animal pigle, and the horns aren't pigle. If your thought is about the fetus, it doesn't make the animal pigle, and it doesn't make the fetus pigle. So it's reading this as that all, all the cases are when your thoughts are about just this object. And it's saying this, that doesn't make the rest of the animal, and it doesn't even make the object itself. And it's not dealing with the scenario when your thought is about the animal. And Einachinami, Rebbe Lezer would say, if your thought is about the animal, the fetus would become a problem. That's what Rebbe Lezer would say. So he says, one minute. Ihachi, if that's true, Hadik Tani Seifa, that's what we taught at the end, 
Kulan lo mefaglim below mit paglim. It repeats itself. It says the following, don't make people, don't become, and then it repeats all of these things, don't make and don't become. Has to lamali. Why is it repeating? It must be repeating to emphasize a broader read of the scenario. So we're not just talking about thinking about the fetus. We're also talking about thinking about the mother that the fetus doesn't become people. Mar says, um, uh, there's a, it's a redundant three times because it says now it says and does it you know you're not high for people so obviously there's a lot of redundancy throwaway phrases in this bright that don't prove to me anything from that Ella I need to buy missing no sir because it wanted to say that it added the point that it doesn't also become no sir and Tommy so it says the trio you know there's like a hair short of a cotton trio there's a there's a Pegel no sir Tommy trio <laughs> so because it wanted to say no sir and Tommy it was redundant and threw in the words they don't become Pegel kind of Pegel so so therefore there are throwaway phrases here <laughs> since it wanted to say that when you bring it as a sacrifice outside you're not chayev so a normal thing that gets packaged with saying you're not chayev when you bring it outside the temple is it's not pigol and you're not chayev outside so there are throwaway phrases here it's not meant to say read this more broadly and the scenario of this breita is when you're just thinking about the fetus but Rebbe Leazar would say I would still defend my position and certainly you could read it in the Mishnah, that if you think about the mother, the fetus does become Pico. Okay, so now the Gemara says like this. Let's wrap this up. Actually, the Mishnah actually supports Rabbi Eliezer's read, and this is what I was pointing out to you, that the Mishnah spoke about the mother, the milk isn't Pico, but it never said if you think about the mother what the story with the fetus is. If your thought is about the fetus, you don't make the mother people. Okay, fine. The eggs, the hotter tani. And then we said, when you have a thought about the mother, that the milk and the eggs are not a problem. What, what about the fetus? It sounds like a thought about the mother, the fetus is. Clearly, it seems that when you have a thought is about the fetus, the fetus is not people. It doesn't make the mother people, it doesn't make itself people. But when the thought is about the mother, the fetus is people. That actually is a very close read of the Mishnah. Okay, so the reason for the asymmetry, it seems, is two different reasons. The more sort of elegant case is that if it's something that's not directed towards the Mizbeach or towards people, it's like the meat that's supposed to be burnt outside, a pico thought isn't relevant because it's not misdirected. But a thought about the about the, the rest of the animal does or does make this pico because it's part of the animal and so on. The case of the fetus, it's harder to explain that way because the fetus normally, you know, it's not like it's, if it's edible, it's edible, and it's not something that shouldn't be eaten, and so on. So Rashi has to say that that's talking about just the physical ability to eat it. It's considered something that's only edible at the chak under dire circumstances, and therefore it's not enough a central part of the of the things that are eaten that it has the power to make the mother pigol. When the mother becomes pigol, according to this, we would say uber yerech imo. We would say the fetus is part of the mother according to this approach, and if the mother is pigol, the fetus is, and it's edible enough to be pigol. That's the way Rashi reads it. Okay, if you want to go for five more minutes, we can I just do. hit the mission. Okay, tanan hasam. So this is going to start as a little digression, but it will circle back. Bali mum. When things that you put on the altar, you know, incorrectly, can you leave, uh, often you can leave them there. There's some things that are so incorrect. They have to be taken down even after they were put. So what's the story about an animal with a blemish? Rabbi Kiva machir b'balei mum. Rabbi Kiva says if that's put on the altar, it can stay up. Others disagree and say that has to come down. He would say that that doesn't apply by a blemish like a missing of a limb, because then that's a complete invalidity. When does he say it? He says that that's a blemish that's like not a missing limb, but like some cataract of the eye. But it really doesn't even have to be that subtle. What it really means is any blemish that's not a missing limb. Why? Because birds, there's no halacha of unblemished by birds. The only thing that makes a bird invalid is that it's missing a limb. So therefore, since by parallel, even if this thing's got a nice, big, obvious blemish, since were, hypothetically, were this a bird, it would not be invalid, that's enough to leave it on the altar. The only, but if it's missing a limb, then it has to come down. Okay, so that's in point number one. And point number two is, um, uh, uh, that's only that first you sanctified it and then it got the blemish. Okay, because so, it was then at one point fit to be on the altar. 
So when does Rabbi Akiva say a Baal Moon can stay? Number one is it first was sanctified, it was fit to be on the altar, and then something happened. And the thing that happened at least went invalidated if it had been a bird. Okay. Now we go on. Let's say you sanctified a female animal as an Ola. He would agree the command to cut a mum lectatia dummy. That ha- if you put it on the altar, you take it down. Because the mum, by this animal, right, the being a female is a mum. Again, it's not a statement about females. If you made sanctified a uh, 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 you know, uh, what do you call it? A uh, a male for a chatos or something. Yeah. Okay. But since it was always invalid, its physical reality was always invalid, so therefore it was never fit for the altar as an ola, and therefore it always has to come down. Okay. Um now. Um now, Masiv Rebbe Zeirah, so Rebbe Zeirah asked on them, based on the bright that we quoted before, Hamala man b'chutz pater. It says that if you put the fetus on the altar outside of the temple, right, you're exempt, right? That was that case before about the fetus and you bring it outside the temple, you're exempt. So if we're talking about a fetus, we're talking about a female, right? Mm-hmm. And the things that you're, what you're chaya for bringing outside of the temple is an ola. That's what you're chaya for bringing outside of the temple. So it's a very, it's a very like clear read of this bright though. Wait, we're talking about a female, but we're talking about bringing it outside the temple. So we're talking about an Ola. So we're talking about a female Ola. Okay, so why are you chayev for female Ola outside of the base of Mikdash since you wouldn't, it would never be allowed to even remain on the altar in the base of Mikdash? Okay, had me iman, if you offered up from the meat of the mother outside the temple, chayav, you're chayav. So what is the only scenario we're talking about about chay for something outside the temple? An ola. But because we're talking about a fetus, we're talking about a female. So, so, uh, so, 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 if Rabbi Kiva would hold that if it was put on the altar, a female ola, it would stay there. Because you're only chay outside the temple for something that in some scenario could be good in the temple. So if Rabbi Akiva held in that case, it was put on the altar, you wouldn't take it down. How many Rebbe Akiva? This could be Rebbe Akiva. That's where you're chayv outside the temple. But if even Rebbe Akiva says in this case it goes down, so how many? Who is this going like? This is something that never would even be allowed to remain on the altar. So why are you chayv? So the Gemara says, Ema fine. No, you read the wrong inference. The inference wasn't Ema hamalamihem b'chutz pater hame imure iman chayv. The inference wasn't that if you put the meat of this female Ola outside of the temple, you're chayav. The inference was if you put the entrails of um, of this uh, theme of, uh, of of the mother, you're chayav. Now, how does that solve the problem? Because um, it solves the problem because um, you're only chayav outside the temple for something that is burnt on the altar. If you put it up, if you burn it on a fire. So, what is burnt on the altar? Either the meat of an Ola or what else, the entrails of any korban. So if we were talking about the meat, the only thing we could be talking about would be the meat of an ola, and it would be a female ola, and that would be our problem. But if we're talking about the entrails, we don't have to be talking about an ola. We could be talking like about a shlomim. Shlomims are allowed to be female, or a chatas. You with me? So if we're talking about the entrails, this isn't relevant to our discussion. We're not talking about an ola, and that's why you're chayv outside the temples. The says, one minute, that may hang tani. It says, if you offer them outside. So how do you switch from talking about them, the fetus, to the, 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 the contrast is offering the meat of the mother, not the entrails of the mother. The imam dumya, they do. And the mother's isn't parallel. So if we're talking about the fetus, you're not chayev. The implication is the mother, you are chayev. Ela ema, fine. We read it this way. If you brought offered the entrails of the fetus outside your potter, which is so bizarre, why would it be talking about the entrails of the fetus? But if the entrails of the mother, and the mother wasn't an ola, it was a shlamin, was a chatas, you'd be chayim. So again, a difficult read of the Brita. The simple reading is yes, that the implication is that you could have a female ola that you're chayav on outside of the temple, and that would say seem that at least somebody would hold that that would be kosher to remain on the mizbeach, on the altar in the temple. Okay, we'll end here.